Hello, my name is Yuhyun Park. I'm a researcher from Nanyang Technological University. Also, I'm a founder of Involution Zero, which is a foundation based in Korea. And also, more importantly, I'm a mom of two kids. And this is my girl when she was two. Did you see her smile when she's like turned back from me with the iPhone? Um, one thing I want to discuss today is our next generation. This generation is very unique generation in, well, throughout the history. They're the first generation, they're born and raised in this pervasive, highly connected, hyper-connected digital world. And if you project yourself to your childhood, to your children, then it's a wrong start because they're basically different species in a way. They live in both digital world as well as this physical world. So, oh, okay. So let's think about where this, our children are. So our children are living in this digital world since very young. So this is a data from Korea. Children start using video games less than three years old. And also, about the time they reach to 10 years old, they have their first device. And they spend more than 50 hours per week in the digital space, which is longer time that they spend with their families, they spend in their schools. So naturally, the digital media and digital devices and whom they meet online can be more influential than their parents and teachers. So we need to know who and what influence our children? What do they do online? Unfortunately, the data are not very pretty. Um, this is a data from Korea. More than 90% of children have access to obscene material through the internet before 12 years old. 50% 50, uh, 50 of children less than 18 years old um, have voluntarily involved in sexting. This is a US data. And 50% of primary school students in Korea have access to rated R game, and many of them are regularly using this rated R games. And 40% worldwide of children between 8 to 18 have experience in cyberbullying. That means 40% of our children have done or have uh, victimized or have done the cyberbullying. China, 70%. Korea, 70%. Singapore, 60%. So this is quite a daunting issue in the digital space. And this is all the world, also worldwide numbers. About 10% of our children. Um, in US, around 11%. Singapore, 9%. Korea, about 50% of children have pathologically addicted to video games. So what is the problem? If you think about the online radicalization issue, if you think about online grooming issue, sex predator issue, you know, they're all happening online. And as Mark Zuckerberg already announced it, privacy is gone. So children are exposed to the digital space without much protection right now. And what is the worst outcome that can be? The children, if you are thinking about it, they start from three years old. Their brain and their they observe everything around them like a sponge. And then, it is not rocket science to think about that if they are exposed to this violence, obscenity, and hatred from the young age, it is, it is very easy to predict that. It is, they tend to get desensitized to violence, hatred, and all this issue. So what is the core of it? It's, I believe the central core of it is that they start to see the other human beings as objects rather than humans being individual who is worthy to be respected and worthy to be treated with the dignity. If you think about porn, porn is a, uh, portraying female and child, children as a sexual object. Hacking is an object of sex, uh, what is it, material gains. Cyberbullying, you see the children seeing others as an object of ridicule and mocking. So I believe this is a key issue of eroding of human values. So 
how do they use the digital media and technology? This is also a very critical issue. So if you look at our children nowadays, they don't look at your eyes, right? They just look at the devices and then they suck into it. And then when they even do the homework, the Singapore data, almost 70% of children, when they do the homework, they do the multitasking. You know, they put the uh, computers and they put a lot of screens online. And then, you know, they have to check Facebook, they have to check Instagram, and then there's a Twitter comes in, and then now we have a mobile, they have to check, right? Constantly chatting with our friends. YouTube video is playing on the back. So they're doing amazing multitasking. But do they really do the multitasking? Research shows that it is not really true. They are not doing the multitasking. They're switching their attentions, shifting attention to one to another. So they're losing actually ability to the true multitasking, truly focusing on the something objects in a proper manner. That's where the addiction comes from. So when you think about the children, why they are so sucked into this the digital mobile, mobile devices? Because they need a constant stimulation, constant distraction and instant gratifications. They cannot be given outside of digital world. That happens in games, that happens in social media, but who on earth in the physical world will give that constant stimulation? It's impossible. So they get bored. So if you think about the gamify of teachings and all these uh, the rhetorics that we hear, that's because children cannot bear the boredom. Nowadays, they don't uh, slow down if they get, don't get constantly stimulated, they feel irritated. So there's a recent news from uh, uh, China, the one boy, 11 years old boy, actually cut up his own fingers. when He was told by his parents to stop smartphone game. It's extreme example, of course, but that's where we are now. It is not that extreme example in ancient settings. We hear uh, tons of tons of <laughs> unthinkable uh, examples because of games and digital devices this day. Why? Because we don't get, we don't get satisfied in a real life the pace. So what we call all of this as in pollution, information pollutions. So digital space are polluted. I'm not saying that all the digital media and all the digital world are bad. It's a mixture of good things and bad things. Good information, true information, false information. Good contents, bad contents. Of course, most of them are trustworthy people, but some are very extremely dangerous people out there. And children are exposed there without much protection. Why? Parents' fault? Or teachers' fault? Actually not, it is not, it's a societal issue. If you think about the speed of change in digital world, it's, it's almost impossible to have a proper protection from the government and also empowerment from the teachers or parents are really difficult to catching up the speed. So it is inevitable that children are exposed to a certain amount of danger because they have to live there. What's the result? I believe the worst part of all this evolution issue is the children are losing ability to think. They lose ability to ponder deeply. They cannot meditate, they cannot sit down, they cannot be mindful, and they cannot discern from right and wrong. I think this is a critical issue, and this is the issue of eroding the human values, I believe. So what should we do? Should we cut off uh, internet from our kids? That's impossible. <laughs> now. The new era has started. Internet things are here. So if you don't check uh, uh, where's a smartphone, the, your refrigerator will be connected to the internet. So there's no escape for children. So 24-7, the disinvolution can come to our children at any time, any place, in any route. So this is the situation now. If you think about this disinvolution, I, I think that it is like a dark cloud covering the clear sky. So this is a, quite a daunting issue. But is it the only daunting issue? No. As you heard from yesterday and today, we heard this artificial intelligence and the machines are getting smarter and smarter and they're taking over our children's job. So our children are not just competing with other children, now they're competing with the machines. 
And in Korea, actually it's happening now, there's a historical match is happening now. Google artificial intelligence super robots called AlphaGo versus one of the smartest person living in this planet, Mr. Lee, who is the champion of Paduk, which is Go uh, uh, Asian chess. And then they had a big match. So far, big one by AlphaGo. So it is official. It is not movie. Machines can self-think. They self-configure. They're smarter than our most smartest person on earth. That means what's happening to our children. So yesterday, the keynote speak, the OECD the director, the Andre had also rightly pointed that we need a plan B, right? Because our current education system is actually fostering children who have a high IQ, right? We want our children to be a doctor and lawyer, accountants and all that. But AlphaGo proved that I can be a better doctor. I can be a better lawyer. I can be a better accountant. So where is our children? So my girl, you saw, she's now six years old. So if you think about it, if she goes to the college education, it will take about 10 to 15 years later, she will be in her first job. But today, we already gave a verdict that my girl has a less economical value than AlphaGo. Basically, any machines, right? So this whole generation has the eroding human issue as that their economic value has already eroded. Then what is the solutions? Now everybody's talking about soft skills, right? We need, to, we need to foster soft skills like creativity, empathy, critical thinking. This is so critical that you know, children have to learn quick, we don't have time, and we, they have to learn all these soft issues so that they can have a competitive edge compared to the machines. But if you think about it, that's all correct. They're all right, relevant uh, remarks. But we have to step back, and then we have to ask ourselves, what are we really afraid about? And are we recognizing that we are comparing our children with the machines, right? So starting point is, I think, completely wrong. We are comparing our children with machines. If you think about it, this is the worst case of erosion of human values. Why? Machines were created for humans. Jobs were created for humans. Digital media was created for humans. Digital technology was originally created for humans. And then we worried and we feel threatened. And we feel that, oh, uh, there is no position. There is no place for our kids. But don't we think that there is a reverse order there? Right? So, I think this is a time for us to regroup ourselves and then look at our children in different ways. We have to redefine their identities. I think this is so critical for our next generation, and especially in this digital era. We have to tell who they are, really are, as humans, right? We, are, we don't want to compete with the, human, the, the machines. We want to control over the machines, right? So we have to give them identity. So there was an article by Steve Hawking said, Oh, because of his great teachers in mathematics, he could become what he has become. So what he's, co what he's coded was very, very amazing. He said, every exceptional person, there is, behind every exceptional person, there is exceptional teachers. What does exceptional teachers do? They define our children. You are something. You can be something, right? We define our children. That makes them something extraordinary. They, they make them something exceptional. It's not their some skills or it's not technology that define our children. So I think it is critical for us to think about what is our next generation is about. I personally believe that this generation is not a like few exceptional ones. Our children's generations are remarkable generation. This is like, I call them digital leader generation who can, who can, whole generation can rise from Korea, from Singapore, from Dubai, from France, from US, everywhere. 
into the digital space, they can become a leaders. They can become master of technologies. They're not afraid of the changes, but the bold overcomers who can be a change maker of the for tomorrow. These are the generation who can do something that we never expected in previous generation imagine. If you think about we define our children as a digital leader generation, then we can flip the coin. Okay, they have a lot of problems. Okay, so what? They, we have to foster values and skill sets so that they can be overcomer from young age. Okay, there are a lot of predators. There are a lot of dangers. Then what should we do? Okay, that in other words, also in the same channel, they can have a loud voice. They can speak and influence, positively influence millions and billions of people using this smartphone. So this is risk, but this is a chance for us to change our attitude towards our children and they can become something really, really extraordinary. So our team, as a research team, we look at what are the key values and key uh, knowledge and skill set that children need to equip for them to survive and meet the demands of digital age. So we call them digital intelligence. So first, digital identity. Definitely children have to know who they are as a digital leaders. They have to know online, offline, they keep their integrity. They know how to manage their online reputations. They know how to actually see them as a global citizen because when they're online, they're naturally global citizen. Online digital use. This is very important. Children know how to be present and balance online and offline so that they can freely in and out. It's not addictive manner. They can freely in and out. That requires self-control. Self-control, will to draw the line, and when to stop, how to stop. These are the whole issue that children have to equip. And digital safety. I believe now children should have uh, another eyes, like fourth eye or third eyes, so that they can detect radar. They can detect and discern what are the hidden dangers of online. Also, they can manage those the uh, hidden dangers of online. And they need to be street smart. They know how to deal with their devices, very street smartening. They know how to protect their uh, online uh, data. This is important, digital intelligence, uh, emotional intelligence. We talk about empathy. We talk about compassion. They know how, to, how they can use the power of emotion. But especially in digital space, this is almost the most critical values because they need to have an extra ear, super ear, so that they can hear other people's heart, even in a Facebook and Instagram. So it's not face-to-face -face communication, but still they need to have uh, empathetic and compassion and power of emotions in a digital space. And communication, definitely this is a crit key critical issue that uh, children have to have. Digital communication is different from online, uh, the physical communication. They need to be aware of digital footprint, whereas the impact of what they do online can be applied to their offline impact. And also, another important thing is about, we need to actually teach them about humility. We always talk about online communication, how effectively they can do, but another key aspect is that, what about humility? And what about the respect to one another? That part has also equally critical as how effectively they can communicate online. And digital literacy. This part is a basic skill set and advanced skill set in the digital space. Uh, we have Mariam who's doing a wonderful work in the digital literacy, promoting the digital skills among the girls. This, they become not just who, who should be able to search, evaluate the data, but they have to be a co-creator of digital technology. This is so critical, important issue that children have to be quit. And lastly, digital rights. People and children have to know what is their human rights, not just offline, but also online. That's very important. Privacy, who said privacy is gone? Privacy is basic human rights. Nobody can say that our children's privacy can be gone. Right? They can say, this is my data. They need to claim their privacy rights. They have to deal with the copyright. 
they have to know the intellectual rights. They know they should know their freedom of speech and how to participate and vocal. They need to know their right to be protected online. Child porn, child trafficking is no. They should be stand up and say no. So based on this framework, our team has developed the digital intelligent quotient. So yes, IQ is important. EQ is definitely important. And I believe DQ matters in the digital age. The reason we developed DQ is to show the readiness of children for the digital future. And this is for the empowerment tool so that children understand their weakness and also their positive strength in the digital intelligence. This is IC Hero Initiative. This is an initiative for primary school students. Our idea is very simple. Let's put the seed of digital intelligence when they start the digital life. When they get the digital device, nine years old, 10 years old, we should start before that. And have them to equip with digital discernment and wisdom so that they can. This, this idea of intelligence can become a guiding light when they navigate digital world. And this is, we have been working with Singapore government and Korean government and companies in Singapore and Korea to develop with the whole suite of uh, uh, online and offline programs. Um, well, we are here because we love our children. I love my kids, right? Uh, whenever I see them, I see my future, I project my future on my kids. I believe you do the same thing to your kids and your students. And this is a time. This is really critical time. And say that they are digital leader generation, and they can become really extraordinary people. So let's empower them with the right tools and right skill set. Thank you very much. Okay, I have a six minutes. We don't have much information or much data on about, for example, violence and bullying prior to the digital age. So we know, I know there's been quite a lot of research since mm -hmm. the digital age on, you know, uh, understanding cyberbullying, for example. Mm -hmm. But do you think that that's only a modern phenomenon or we had bullying before? It wasn't cyber, it was localised, it was in the playground, it was in the classroom. And now it's just gone on a larger platform, we can view it and control it and observe it more easily. Yes. So, um, do you think what's happening on, on, on the internet, for example, is just representing what happened in society pre prior to that, particularly in terms of violence? Uh, that's a really good point. Um, nowadays, bullying and cyberbullying are now intermingled, physical bullying. So, there is no it's a clear cut between cyber and a physical bullying. And I'm absolutely right, it's an extension of their bullying acts in the physical world to the, phys uh, the cyber world. But critical things is that the you know, nature of cyberbullying is different. Yes. So children say, OK, I kick you in a physical bullying. And then the, the kids can go home and they forget about it. They feel safety at home, at least, because that happened in the playground. But cyberbullying can happen 24-7. Even they're sitting with their own mom, they can be in danger. So 
and 24-7. And that is, uh, there's one, the key aspect. And second aspect is that it can go viral. Now, there is an incident in the U.S., the 14 years ago, commit a suicide quietly after um, dinner finished. She went up to her room and commit suicide. Why? It's just because of one photo. She um, took a selfie, the sexting, took a selfie of naked her photo and then gave to uh, her boyfriend and her friend actually snatched it. And then it became like widespread. So it's not just his school, her school. So it's the six schools around her regions actually cyber bullied her. But think about it. It's just simple act. It's just, we all, we all do stupid when we were 14, right? And uh, the impact of this simple behavior can become disastrous. So that is the critical part of cyberbullying. And uh, this part is the one that we need to teach children. You know, this, the consequence is different. Yes. Sorry, so, so you're saying uh, the platform has changed, not necessarily the nature of human nature. That's yes, right. if you are, we are still human, yes. <laughs> yes. The role of teachers and parents, always the things that I tell to all teachers and tell to, uh, all parents, they're much more powerful than they think. <laughs> they're really much more powerful than they think because they feel actually threatened when, when it comes to digital issue and then they feel like they feel empower, less empowered and then helpless because they felt like they don't know anything and their kids know better than their, uh, their, uh, you know, themselves. But like he said, this is, this is like human issue. Yes, and parents can intervene and teachers can intervene when things happen. And then they have to intervene in a very early stage. As soon as possible, they have to act and upon it. And uh, I strongly suggest that school has to have the protocol of dealing the cyber issues. And uh, they have to, teachers have to be professionally trained about how to deal with the digi various digital issues that can arise in a school. And your second question is about the, yeah, 20 years. If I know that, I'll be giving another talk, you know. <laughs> yes. Uh, but one thing for sure is that um, this is a time that we have to make an action. It, yes. Yes, uh, in Korea and Singapore, there is a mandatory four hours per a week and uh, for semester for the cyber wellness education uh, in Singapore by, um, by MOE. Uh, but I personally believe that it's not enough. Yes, they, uh, we can do better. Yes, but it's a awareness of policy makers as well as awareness of uh, the ministry and uh, uh, the schools have to raise for them to be better equipped because the resources are out there, but it's more about how we can integrate this resource into the school. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, as you were presenting, I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh -huh. The analogy that kept coming to my mind was uh, the invention of the automobile, which gave us amazing things, but out of that we needed to invent uh, seat belts and, yes. and airbags and so forth. Sure. Something I see in the classroom a lot with, with grade four children mm -hmm. is the need for constant stimulation. Mm -hmm. And as a 50 year old man, I'm not as entertaining as a, as a game on, on, online might be. Um, are you aware of any data that I could draw upon in terms of um, the amount of exposure a child should have at different ages and develop, in terms of their development? Sure. Um, in terms of neural connections mm -hmm. uh, in their mind and their brain to set them up as a person where they can stay focused. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sure. Uh, it's a um, controversial question in a way because um, previously the American Pediatrician Association suggested that you know the two hours of screen times per day 
which is very, very, how to say, uh, cruel, because nobody can kiss two hours minimum, uh, maximum. Um, but this is a good suggested guideline uh, for the, it, it's not like by age group, but it's for the, uh, the children. And about the, your age, the grade four is applied. And along that line, there was a study, um, it's not the digital media, it's for the TV viewing, the how much TV viewing, traditional TV viewing can affect the children's performance in a school score. It's interesting that it goes up until 10 hours per week and then decline after that. So 10 hours per week and decline. And I think that there is a correlation between this, this 10 hours magic and uh, also uh, the digital media. Uh, because this is the, how the children engage until 10 hours. They learn also a, a lot, great deal. Um, when I say 10 hours, it's, ex it's only entertainment time. It doesn't count uh, the school homework and other activities. So uh, they learn still, they learn. But if it is goes excessive, it's more harmful than a benefit. Yes. Sure. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I, I guess the time's up. Yes, yeah, so we can continue our discussion. <laughs>